Welcome back to Yuricon 2023. Uh, we are here at the I Want to Make Yuri panel. Uh, what is the right medium for me? And we have some awesome guests, uh, Nara Moore, Ari, Roxy, and I'm here, your moderator, Laura Weir. It is uh, great to be here with all of you. So we're going to go through and we're going to talk about uh, what kind of uh, media we create and you can get an idea of what kind of media might be right for you to create. So I'm just gonna introduce myself. Uh, my name is Laura. I started writing sapphic fanfic way back in 1999. Um, I finished my first sapphic original novel this year and that will be coming out later this year, Mirror of My Heart, look for it. Uh, I also write other types of fiction. Uh, I, my first novel was uh, The Eighth Key, the, the 2021 Rainbow Award winner for Best Gay Fantasy Romance. Um, and uh, you will see some other, keep keeping out for other books coming out soon. Nara, you want to talk about uh, your background? I'm a light novel author and um, prolific um, fan fiction um, author. Um, I, I'm personally, I'm writing in a serialized format. So I have one complete fan fiction novel um, based on um, regarding Siaka Siaka. And I'm almost finished with the serialization of, of my girlfriend almost got me killed. So we had wild sex. It's, <laughs> it's all in rough draft and we're, and I'm, yeah, I, I I just last week released the 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 climax scene where where the 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 love interests finally just really start meshing, um, and starting to plot my third novel. So exciting! I love that name. My girlfriend almost got me killed, so we had wild sex. That is a uh, a a name to catch people's eye. <laughs> Well, I know one of your questions is how do you pick your names and um we'll get to we'll it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We'll we'll get there though, I promise. All right. Ari, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh what you do? Hi, I'm Ari. I I do web comics. I I do web comics because I don't have any faith in my ability to write words and I'm looking at like the words I wrote for myself and going, oh yeah, you should find it do that um but yeah i i've been doing web comics um via the webtoon app for since 2015 i was uh, lucky enough to place in a competition they ran and i've been doing so on and off since um that doesn't sound like luck I that sounds like skill <laughs> i feel like luck had a lot of, to do with it i was lucky enough to have the time to do it at the time i, I it really a lot of it really was luck it was it was this voting like sort of round not round robin but it was like they pitted you a tournament style competition thing and I was lucky enough that I had like a tumblr fan art sort of thing going on and I, I could drum up votes like luck actually really had a lot to do with it. um yeah and so I've got on my third web comic um my first web comic is completed and in print I even have, have books Looks very exciting. Oh, um, my second web comic I abandoned because I had a, a bit of a writing meltdown and realized that I was sort of trying to push myself in a direction that just wasn't working for me as a writer. Um, my third web comic is in progress and I'm enjoying it a lot and I'm feeling that I figured out who I am as a writer. So that's good. That's wonderful. Roxy, you want to talk about your background and what you're working on? Hi everyone, I'm Roxy. I be, I'll be talking about visual novels. I kind of wanted to story tell for quite a while and I kind of just end up helping friends start off with them like proofreading, editing, and just playing their games and beta, beta testing them. One friend was struggling with her work so I kind of just jumped in and helped her complete Starlight Vega back in 2015. Mm. And then since then I started working on my own titles, uh, run of pretty much like a little small somewhat large studio by indie standards. And our first title was released um, back in 2020, uh, known as Mizuchi, and released on both Steam and Itch.io. And right now we're still trying to get 
the publishers working out to the port to console will be mm -hmm. out early next year. Exciting. And you have a mm -hmm. picture of this? Oh, yes. beautiful. Yeah, it's a fantasy romance inspired by the legend of white serpents. Um, it's a really big top four Chinese folklore story in China, and it's pretty well known all over Asia. But we're doing a Yuri version of it, which is pretty uncommon. It's a more more typical, pretty much a version of a Romeo and Juliet story. Mm -hmm. And my current in progress story is called Red Rebellion. Um, it's another Yuri fantasy title mix up between Red Robin Hood and Red Riding Hood. And it's more historical fiction. So it'll be set in like late medieval times in England and it has a very strong, large um, LGBTQIA majority cast as well. Oh, it looks know, delightful. Yeah, we should work on it. <laughs> yeah, the art is Thank just you. gorgeous. Yes, yeah, she did awesome. Oh, wonderful. All right, well, let's move forward uh, to the questions. We can get to the first question. We can. So let's start with what drives you to create? Um, Ari, do you want to take this one first? Oh, all right. Um, I guess just having like both loving fiction and then when an inkling of an idea sort of pops into my head and combined with loving fiction and my brain starts, you know, niggling at it and going this could happen and that could happen in this character and and then there's a story and I have to get it out um and I want other people to read it and connect with it and that's actually probably the most satisfying bit when someone else reads it and connects with it so I, I guess it's wanting the story in my head to come out in a way that other people can experience it too I like that description uh Roxy how about you what drives you to create Hmm. I guess I kind of fall like that idea that um you should create what you want to see, especially if you don't see what you want out there. So that pretty much is a motivating factor. And um, I think for me, if I want to, you know, connect with other people, I realize uh, the good way to do that was to do storytelling with them. So that's pretty much how I got into um, writing and trying to do a game in a, in a sense. Nara? I, I've always wanted to be an author and it, I never had the discipline for, for ages. So I was a computer professional because I got, a, I got a early Apple II so I could write and I end up writing about the computer. Um, <laughs> but some point I got in, I got interested in Yuri and um, I got involved with fan fiction and I just, I don't know, I don't know what drives me to, to, to want to create, but I just, I love creating. I, I, I love the process of, of seeing something go from niggly little uh, I, ideas to, wow, these girls really love each other and, they, and, they're, and, and they're going out. I also think I'm somewhat driven by wanting to see more um, edgy fiction. Um, uh, my next novel has a, a has a, has an ace character and um, a trans character and a trans max max character. Um, and there's a lot of DNS and and fetish stuff. So um, that's kind of what drives me. Something, something out of the norm, something you can't get anywhere else or see anywhere else. Kind of similar to Roxy, but in a in a different way. Yeah, fan fiction is such a valuable, uh, tr like starting place. I think a lot of us. I, I, we'll we'll move on to the next question in a second. But how many of us started with fan fiction? Did we all start with it, or uh, did anyone? Did any of you not start with it? I mean, I started with fan art. That's. <laughs> fan comics I, I did yeah. a few fan comics with my yeah that's the same thing right <laughs> Roxy I didn't I didn't catch did you start with fan fiction if I count like my 12 year old self I guess so it's <laughs> kind of like a Sarah Moon thing and then I guess my cousin kind of teased me about it so I kind of pushed away from writing mm, and then I ended up doing fan art instead yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a it's a gateway, I think, for a lot of people. 
speaking of which, um, I didn't say what drives me to create. Personally, I've always read a lot um, and I've always told myself stories uh, my whole life. And I think that's just it. I like telling stories. <laughs> I like, and I like sharing stories. And so that's, that's, that's really the heart of it is, is wanting to tell a story and wanting to share, share the stories. And that's it. So let's move on to the next question. So we're going to talk about the, our different mediums, um, novel, light novel, graphic novels, all the different, all the different things. So let's, uh, let's get to the list. I believe we have, yes, in visual novels, as well as comics, of course, for like web novels and stuff. So um, we're going to talk about uh, the different places you can get it. Um, most of these have physical versions. You can get them at Amazon. You can put them in independent bookstores. But a lot of them have digital ones, like um, like the uh, ongoing serialized webtoons and things like that. Um, so it's it's th those can be a pretty good place to start because doing physical ones can be a little bit intimidating, right? Uh, you gotta you gotta go through some kind of official distributor. So if you're starting out and you're not sure where to start, um, doing it digitally first, uh, writing fiction, writing fan fiction, doing art, putting it online, that can be a really good good gateway, a good, a good starting point for people who are not sure which direction they wanna take it. Um, and if you, if you find yourself doing more of one thing than another, you may wanna change direction. If you're starting writing and you find yourself just wanting to draw pictures all the time, maybe you need to steer in the comic direction or the, uh, the animation direction. Uh, and on the other hand, if you find yourself just writing out every scene instead of drawing it, maybe you need to be steering back in the light novel and novel direction. Anyone have any comments before we move on to the next question? I guess I want to tell okay. people what a visual novel was. Oh, yes, please do. Please share us, that with us. So um, it's actually a, you know, a video game and that uh, it's different from the other video game genres because it's more a uh, very narrative focused, very minimal gameplay. You don't really require anything um, highly interactive besides maybe adding some choices, which could lead to like branching routes as well as maybe different endings. So I guess it's really pretty kind of similar to like choose your own adventure books, but with um, addition of images and sound. And historically it kind of started in Japan and that it kind of flourished there in the PC market. And because it pretty much fulfilled a niche of video games, which allowed you to focus primarily on romance, which the other games kind of weren't nearly into that. I think it's an interesting point here. The um, All of the other types that we're looking at here, if you get a physical copy versus reading the digital version, the experience is going to be slightly different uh, if you're holding the book in your hands versus versus what you experience on the screen. But um, in the case of a visual novel, you can you can certainly get a, a physical CD or download a, a copy online. But the the way to play it is generally always going to be some kind of digital method, whether it's a generally like a, a computer or some kind of console. Um, you're always it's always going to be a digital experience. So there's a little bit it's a little bit different from the typical physical book that you would hold in your hand and sit and read, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it requires you to be a little more interactive. I guess you're physically clicking. Um, I guess some people like to add like a little bit of puzzles or mini games, um, especially if there's like a dating sim factor or like dressing up into different clothes as a feature of the game. So a little bit more character uh, player involvement. In that yeah, I, I imagine it's, it's more immersive to have uh, the interactive quality where you're interacting with the characters directly. I think that's kind of an, or or even if you're just making decisions for them, but watching them interact with each other, it's kind of an exciting different way of uh, interacting with the media. 
yeah, that'd be ideal if people like to, you know, write in a more complex manner. I know some people just do very straightforward visual novels where they're pretty much more like a novel, pretty straightforward, just no choices. You kind of just see it play on screen as you're clicking through, maybe like mm. a, seeing it like a low key static film to some degree, depending on how much they put into it. Anybody else want to talk about their medium of choice before we move on? I'd add a few words about light novels. Like um, Roxy was saying, I think it's it's kind of, it derives out of Japan. It's not a native um, Western uh, form. More than a than a novelette, but like like a short novel, usually easier easier usually usually an easier read, though there are some adult um, light novels. Um, That's probably pretty much all I would add. Would you say that a light novel would be in any way similar to what we consider uh, YA novels in the West? It's similar, but also dis <clears throat> dissimilar. Because at least in Japan, light novels are not necessarily pitched to, I mean, that's a big demographic, but adults are reading them. So mm -hmm. there is a, it, it has a, has a broader demographic um, readership than YA. Um, so yes and, and no. <laughs> it does have this it does have this there are some other similarities which I think are coincidental that light novels the oh, Japanese literature tends to be very first person and YA tends to be first person um I think that's more a coincidental um correlation but it does have also that similarity Ari before we move on did you want to say anything about your medium of choice don't feel pressured, it's but if you like. interesting looking that like it's listed Webtoon Tapas and Tuffy Tune. And I'm just thinking about, you know, how a decade ago these websites did not exist in the Western sphere and every webcomic was on its own little website and publishers were, you know, not really publishing much that was manga influenced at all. And it's just interesting how much has changed. We've gone from page at a time on your own website being the dominant form of webcomic to mobile scrolling mostly on the webtoon app which is absolutely dominating um being the dominant form um the other thing i think is interesting is looking at the marketing terms and light novels and visual novels both emerge from japan as a medium and so you do call them yuri but like in comics it's considered like very weebish to describe your comic as a manga you don't do that if you're not japanese and so you similarly don't use the word yuri to describe your comic if you're not mm. Japanese, so like GL took over. And that's just interesting to me because I feel like what I do is just as Japan inspired as a visual novel or a light novel. And yet, and yet if I started using the word Yuri, people I think would look at me like, but you're not Japanese, what are you doing? And I think, I wonder how that evolved, that, that difference there. Mm. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, yeah, I, I think, don't know why I was going with that. Just no, I, I think that's I think that's an, going, huh. I think that's an excellent point. Uh, in the case of of, of novels, um, in at least the one marketed to Western audiences, I feel like using Yuri would be a very a little bit confusing uh, because uh, it's still somewhat a, of a niche even with the much wider influence of, of Japanese media than it used to have, it's still very niche in many ways. <clears throat> so a term like uh, WLW for women who love women, um, sapphic, lesbian, these are terms which are more broadly understood by a Western audience. Uh, in, I, I find it interesting that in your case, it's it's less that the fear that people won't understand it and more that yeah. you want to be taken seriously and not dismissed yeah, yeah. as as being a uh uh as pretending wannabe. to be Japanese, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, people absolutely would understand Yui, but like none of the big GL comics call mm -hmm. themselves Yui, except maybe Mage and Demon Queen occasionally, but she's from the Philippines. So I feel like that's the, the guys of the Western audience. 
it's Asia. It's, you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I think we're ready to move on to the next question. If we can get our excellent slide wrangler to. Thank you. What are the strengths of your medium for storytelling? That's a that's a great question. Uh, I can start us off on that one. I feel like <clears throat> there is so much flexibility with words. Uh, I'm not a visual person, and so I tend to have a bias towards words. Um, and I just feel that there's just so, you, you can do so much. Um, there is the old adage, of course, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And that's true in many ways. And and here I am saying this to, to artists, so they're going to No, I'm like... with you 100% on this. Um, <laughs> okay, you don't have to, to worry about drawing. You can just write. You can <laughs> position. You don't need to go, how can I get this into dialogue? You can just have it in the notes. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. You, you have so much power to evoke uh emotional responses you can evoke you can you can um address different senses talk about the smell of baking bread or or fallen leaves you know feel the wind on your face um and so there's there's just a lot you can do um to to establish a scene and and to to delve into emotions um you can do things with internal thoughts um, obviously, you could still do this with with comics and and uh, and many types of visual storytelling. The the place where it gets most awkward is something like um, movies or anywhere where you're you're watching a character and then you either have to cut to some sort of internal narration or uh, or have a, like a, a thought bubble or something. Um, but I feel like you can integrate that kind of internal uh, ideas and thoughts more naturally into text, if you do it right. <laughs> it can be tricky and it can be done poorly. But uh, but I think that those are both things which are, are um, strengths in specifically the written word. Uh, let's see. Roxy, how about you? What are, what are the strengths of your medium for storytelling, do you think? Mm, let's see. I think kind of like earlier I mentioned about the whole player interaction would get really more involved in your work. Um, I think what's pretty unique to visual novels is that you can pretty much um, handle a very large cast and that you aren't really limited to, you know, how many pages are in your book, but like you can really go out and go different directions, different point of views. So you can have a pretty even a proper ensemble cast of one story. And you can also write really long stories in a shorter period of time. And you keep, and there's really no standard in this field, so you can go as long as you want. Um, Two hundred thousand words for the word count is pretty normal for some people. I think in Japan it's even larger. I think one really popular uh, visual novel was like thirty hours long to read. I played. Goodness, yeah, and of course that's a that's a feature, not a bug. The length of time it takes, right? You, yes, you say, oh, yes. want it to be as long as possible. Yeah, it's yeah. How many resources? How many hours of gameplay do I get for the money I've shelled out, right? So. Yeah. Um, Ari, how about you? What What do you think the strengths of your medium for storytelling are? Um, I think in comparison to words only, I think stories that use lots of visuals are less effort for the reader. It sort of takes a commitment to focus on a sentence and keep on reading the sentence. You're asking that commitment from the reader. The comics, I feel like there's slightly less of a commitment. It's a more passive experience, which means that it can be easier, I think, to immerse the reader because you can sort of trick them into it because they don't have to put as much effort into actually doing the reading. Like it's harder to make a mistake that knocks someone out of the comic, I feel, than it is in prose, I, I feel, because um, it's just less effort. It's so easy for a reader to just look at pictures. Um, so I think you can get really immersive and really like get the emotions right in there because they're not putting the effort into reading. So they're like right there dumped in the middle of it. And you can get some really cinematic experiences, I think, with the art. Very cool. Nara? Well, you hit most of them when you talked about novels. Um, light novels have all the advantages of, of novels. 
I, I would say the difference is when you when you think light novel, you're thinking something that's easier to read. So it's a more casual read. It, it's something you might read commuting or you can pick up or not. You think a novel, whether true or not, you're thinking, well, I'm gonna I have to invest some energy into this. Um, light novels, there's there's less of that. It's it's a much more casual read. I'm not sure if it's an advantage or not, but the other thing is light novels, at least at this point, are still very embedded in the, Jap it, the Japanese culture. So um, well, I was losing that. that. So you're, when you say a light novel, you're, right off the bat, it's almost like a genre statement of mm -hmm. you're saying this is for this kind of person. Um, so it, I'm not sure that's an advantage. In some ways, it's an advantage. Um, light novel readers like light novels, and they'll say, what's a good light novel? On the other hand, it's a disadvantage because, well, it's kind of niche. <laughs> hmm, that's really interesting. I, I know people who feel that way about fan fiction, too, where they want to read specifically fan fiction. They don't, they don't actually want to read original work as much as they want to read fan fiction and consider it, in a sense, of course, there, it's a medium and there could be all kinds of fan fiction, and yet they consider it, in a sense, its own genre. Yeah. <clears throat> and okay. If, if anyone who writes fan fiction, you know, there there are some rules that if you write good fan fiction are different from novels and light novels. It's true. Before it's moving true. on, actually, yes. some of our mediums are serialized and some of them aren't. I think maybe we should get into that as a strength as well, what's the strength of having one final product go out of the world and what's the strength of having a medium that, you know, you're serializing a bit at a time. So I know that I can post an update and see people's reaction and go, ooh, they're having the emotional reaction I want or ooh, they're not having the emotional reaction I want and I can massage my next few weeks of scripts so I can even go back in and make an edit. Um, like I think that's a real strength to a serialized medium. You get instant feedback and you can instantly see whether your story is doing what you want it to do um i don't know if the web serial wants to chime in like but you've both written fanfic before um i think that's a really good point um with the novel like what the, the type of that i've released the advantage and disadvantage is that it has to be finished before it goes out you know, the, the occasional people who re release unfinished novels notwithstanding, <laughs> uh, won't name any names there, but you, you all know what I'm talking about, where you read a novel and you get to the end and then it's, wait for the next one in the series. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> but, <Never comes. laughs> but most of the time, and certainly anything I write, is going to be a complete story. Uh, a, and um, the advantage to that is, if, if I'm writing and something is starting to go off the rails, then I can go back and change it. And earlier in the novel, I can say, oh, I, I, I referenced this thing early on when I'm rereading it. And, and I can go, I can, I can reference that now. And I can go back and change things a little bit to make sure it fits, you know, or, or if I, somebody reads it and says, oh, the middle part is a little, it, it drags a little, I can go back and put something else interesting in the middle. Um, being able to, to make it consistent uh, I think is is one of the most valuable things for me as a as a writer and um, turn out a product which is uh, as 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 complete as I can make it. But you're absolutely right that I along the way don't get that feedback, and so I have to rely on on a small group of editors to tell me, oh, this is working or this isn't working, rather than a full audience to say, hey, I'm really liking where this is going, or hey, you know, what, why don't you do this? Ari, do you ever let people uh, give you ideas and, and say, oh, if you, yeah, I'd love to see this character do this. And you're like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. Or do you feel like like that it's not a good idea to do to to take to take suggestions? I've got a pretty good idea of where I want the story to go. And when, if I'm making changes based on feedback, it's to make sure that people are experiencing the story I want them to experience. But like. I might bring a minor character back for cameo if you know they were really popular and people want to see more of them. And like in my most in my current webcomic, the characters play a Dungeons and Dragons analog, and people really want to see the next session. So I might try and 
get that in some way, even though I have no plans. But people are really excited to see more of that. So I'll, I don't know. It's in the back of my head. Is you know, if if the opportunity to fit it in, you know, I'll do that because people want it. Um, but I wouldn't like take ideas. Like I've got too clear a sense of where I want the characters to go to, to anyone else's ideas to sort of fit in. And there's also I suppose a lot of copyright concerns there. Yeah. This actually ties into another question I want to bring in. We don't have a slide for it, but I wanted to say, uh, when do you get your, when and how do you get validation um, knowing that you're, you may not get any feedback uh, until, and this is, ties into, of course, the name of the panel, panel, you know, what's the right medium for me if you're somebody who needs validation and believe me, Yes, I release novels, but I still need validation. So <laughs> when and how do you get it? Uh, Roxy, how about you? With with the, the visual novels, you won't be seeing a lot of validation until it's released, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you can't really show anything because it's kind of like spoilers. And then when it's almost there, you, you're just like, okay, maybe I can get some beta readers if they were a previous fan or not but even then they kind of don't want to play it because they kind of want to see the complete game so they want to see a in draft version and they're already invested so like no I'll do it later so <laughs> pretty much you just rely on your teammates and hope they have time to draw, to play it and give you feedback and then adjust accordingly and hopefully be ready by the time it's out it's interesting since you're working in a group on a team um I imagine that you have some feedback and validation for each other like oh that looks that art is perfect or oh I that line is beautiful you know I love I love when that character said that thing that probably helps right yeah usually um sometimes I hired like two really good uh, fans my first game to help me in the second game I realized I really needed them to like give me that little bit of encouragement to be like okay this is good this is a great idea or this is or is this a bad idea what do you guys think about this direction we're going in they're like oh hmm. and they'll give me that kind of feedback and then the artist has a lot of her own opinions of like how she wants the characters to look or how they're going to act and is their clothes appropriate or should they be changed and any of the costume changes the characters might get so it's pretty active I guess kind of almost like play to some degree it's people constantly adjusting and giving their own input mm -hmm. yeah for me I have um I have a small team of editors um and my including my family <clears throat> and I I show my drafts to them and they tell me what's wrong with it and what's right with it and that's a, a big part of of how I shape my my novels is if they like it <laughs> And if they don't, then then they say, yeah, oh, you know, like I said, like the middle part is dragging or this is this is just not working. You just need to rewrite this. Um, but getting that that feedback of, oh, I, you know, this this is really good. This is working. Even just one person telling you that or telling me that can can just really help uh, my build my confidence. Um, it also, of course, is super just super motivating when you meet somebody who read your book and liked it. I got, I was so lucky to meet somebody. I, we, we went to a book fair and hand sold a few copies. We sell our, our books in bookstores, but um, I had some, we had some extras and we took them to a, a street book fair and we sold some one year. And then they had another one like a year and a half later. And so we went back and somebody who had read my first book, The Eighth Key came and said, Oh yeah, I read this. I, I I really liked it. I shared it with my friends. And it was such that was so mm -hmm. flattering to hear. And and I, I said to him, um, oh, you know, I, I I have an idea for a sequel. And he's like, Really? I want to read it. I was like, okay, <laughs> that I'm uh, motivated to work on this sequel now. That's that's so exciting. But of course, that doesn't happen very often in the wild. And of course, sometimes you'll get negative comments and so you need to be ready to to handle those too so that's it's tough nara how about you how do you get external validation i've chosen to write in a serialized format which is more common with light novels um as you come in about it, it's similar to romances R romances uh, i understand novel romances are also can do serialized so i have a shorter 
time span of of reinforcement but quite frankly i get most of it from beta readers not from not from readers themselves who will say well i really like this or um this your, your character you, you know this character is like this what why, why aren't they doing that um but it has a shorter um even if you release um whole things it'd be shorter than say a novel um, right. light novel authors are usually expected to churn out a, a novel a, year, a, 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 a volume a year or, or more. Um, How many words so, is a light novel typically? About around, around 40,000. Okay, so short a shorter novel basically. It's 40,000 when it for, for released volumes on the web, there is no real standard for uh, what what a light how how long a light novel is? Mm. Started, like I, I said, start on oops. the web as serialized and then are are repackaged it, it, as as volumes. Yeah. So Ari, you said that you get your reinforcement as you go along. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> Advantage of a serialized story again. Yeah. Um. So <clears> first, <throat> my updates go up to Patreon and. They are very validating. They are wonderful. I, I it's like, whoa, thank you for paying me and validating me. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Like, I, I feel like I would shrivel up and just, you know, my soul would just couldn't do it without without regular validation. I am so impressed that by people who don't get regular validation. I think I suggested this question because I was curious about it. Because yeah, I get I get lovely comments first from patrons and then from the public update and I, I absolutely need them. I thrive on them. I couldn't do this without them. Um, actually, I have a question for you, please. Um, so when you like share with your editors and get feedback in that sense and validation in that sense, like, ha so I love novels. I have tried to write novels. I never get very far because I feel like I've never gotten to a point where there's something worth sharing to get validation on. Like mm -hmm. at what point do you, like, can you share a chapter at a time? Do you do a whole first draft in like a month and then share that? Like, how, how do you, like, I'm releasing not just weekly, but completed stuff weekly, stuff that's worth sharing. Whereas a novel, at what point does it, like, if it takes that long to be complete, I just, my, my head can't do that. Um. <laughs> for me, I think, well, I, it's, I think it's different for different people. Um, when, they, how much they share of their work at a time. Uh, for me, I I generally have a pretty good chunk. Um, I think my first one, I was about halfway through when I shared it. I and then um, and then I was able to. I was I was, I was struggling, and then I was able to get direction from my uh, my editors. Um, <clears throat> for my second one, I mostly. It was mostly done by the time I, I shared it, but it's a it's a bit of a shorter novel. Um, my first one, I think, it came in at eighty thousand. My second one was only like fifty thousand uh, words. So, I, yeah, I, I think it's just a matter. Different people have different things. Some people have a lot of writers have writing groups, and they'll share like a chapter and exchange chapters and read each other's work. Um, Sean and McGuire talks about the importance of finding people who are, are your peers people who are at the same level as you in terms of they're not they're like if you're a start if you're a beginning writer you find other people who are beginning writers if you're you know mid mid lister you find other mid listers and 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 work try to work with other people who are are experiencing the same things that you are and and learn from them um but uh yeah I, I think it's just I think it's a very personal thing um I, I like writing enough and I've done enough writing of fan fiction and stuff that I can I can set myself a particular goal and and work up to that to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm I'm ready to show this to people now. But honestly, if you have people who are willing to read it, if you you could you could do it a paragraph at a time, you know, serial serialized style, you know, you put up a paragraph every day. Mm -hmm. Some people do things like that, you know, Wattpad and and other um formats. Uh, serialized novel writing is actually something uh, Amazon is offering now and, and you know, and the evil A and, and other platforms will offer that. So, and and of course it's it's a fairly popular format in China too, where you release a chapter at a time uh, online specifically. So it's, if you want to write that way, you can. Um, 
and it's it's an increasingly popular one. Uh, for me, it just I, I'm able to do it this way, and I don't think I would. I think I would be too nervous that I would want to go back and change something <laughs> to to release to 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 do it a, a part at a time the way you do it. Yeah. There's a disadvantage of serialization. You read serialized mm -hmm. stuff. There's more checkoffs, guns, and and odd things laying around that you you put in there that you were going to use, and then you just said, "No, well, no, I'm not, I'm not going to use it." Yeah. Nara, how much do you share with your beta readers? Do you finish your novel first and then show it to them? I share a a, a chapter at a time. Um, I have a sort of a timeline of of I have a. I share a chapter, I put a, the next chapter basically in final form, which I then send out to my, my graphic artist, and then it's however far I, I am ahead of, ahead of that. But I, I do it a, a, a chapter at a time to beta readers and a chapter at a time to regular readers. Cool. I, uh, I do want to start moving on because we do have a few more questions on the slides. Uh, unless, Roxy, if you have anything to add, feel free to speak up. And if not, uh, let's move on to the next slide. All right. That's so <laughs> the, obvious, uh, the obvious counter to the previous one, what are the weaknesses of your medium? Ari, what do you, you, would you want to lead off on that one? Um, well, other than what we just talked about with serialization, where once it's out, there's only so much you can do. I've definitely introduced characters who just kind of vanished and I couldn't fit them back in and I flooded and it didn't happen. And yet, yeah, also you have to draw everything for a comic. You have to draw absolutely, or oh, 3D models, but you know, you can't go, I would like to write a battle scene with like massive armies and horses and just not think about how it gets drawn because it gets drawn. Um, you know, I'm never going to write a story with horses probably because I don't want to draw horses. Um, there are lots of stories I'd love to write. I don't want to draw that. <laughs> super time consuming drawings you're, you're working much slower if you're drawing everything out and you have to be able to physically draw it um mm. that that's an affiliate like only do a comic if you love drawing because you're going to be doing so much of it uh, uh nara what about you what, what do you think are the weaknesses of the written word medium well for light novels i would say it is the biggest one is its niche and Quite frankly, a, a Western light novel um, writer is fighting the current. Um, most companies just say, like like J Novel and and whatever, just say, well, you're not Japanese. We're not in, we're not interested in looking at it. Mm. Um, they have recent, they have a contest which is open to West for Westerners, but uh, you know that's pretty limited. Another disadvantage, I think. Because of its format, because you, particularly the way it was laid out with with content is, you think light novel, you think illustrations. Well, that either means you need to draw your illustrations, or you need to be paying someone to draw them. So that's that's part of my team is someone that draws, hmm. which is fine, but the reality is, publishers don't want your art. Mm. If you get your light novel bought. They don't want to see the art that you had done You're from your favorite artist. Oh, test just says, we don't want art. We'll, we'll, we'll find an artist for you. Hmm. So that's a disadvantage of when you're thinking about it if you're drawn to that format because of the art. Hmm. I see. Yeah. Have you have you considered self-publishing at all or or looking for a local indie? I'm going to repackage um, my current novel into um, into volumes, and I'm going to try releasing through through Amazon and and in the forty um, word chunks. See how see how that goes. I guess another advantage is light novels often use new side stories. So mm -hmm. so that's the kind of, that's the kind of fun thing about about, about it is. You don't usually see that with novels, but I can write, you know, just say, oh, this in was well, really lovely as you write. I'm sure as a novelist you've seen, you've written it and you see this chunk and you go, it's a wonderful chunk, but it doesn't advance the plot. 
It makes us, <laughs> it bogs it down. I got to pull it. It's so the kill your darlings. It develop, and it's a strength. And I got a strength story. Yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, for me, uh, I think that one of the weaknesses is that um, there are a lot of people who are very visually motivated. And so for them, words, I have to work extra hard to make sure that that they're getting something out of what I'm writing. But at the same time, a lot of people don't want to read description and aren't interested. And they they want to get to the, the interactions between the characters. So since there are no pictures in in a novel except maybe the cover art um the you are basically completely reliant on your own powers of description to set a scene and if you are somebody like me who's who aren't who is not visually motivated then you have to force yourself to be a person to write that scene to figure out you know all the details uh you're not writing a movie script where the scene is going to just be there you you have to you have to figure out um and so diff different people have different strengths mine for me one of my weaknesses is description and so i pay extra careful care to focus on description so that um i can can make sure that that i don't miss that and just have two heads talking to each other in a room <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise i will do that uh, cause I'm interested in the characters talking to each other. That's, 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 that's what I love. <laughs> uh, Roxy, how about you? What do you think are the weaknesses of your medium? It has an extremely high failure rate. Mm. There's just so many pieces you have to consider, like the programming, the writing, the art, the music, the sound effects. So you can either do it yourself or find people. And so it's like a struggle just to get it to finish line. And so... If you do actually complete a game, there is actually a bit of a camaraderie with other game developers to kind of like, ah, oh, you understand the suffering we all went through and that it's so hard to get to this point. So good job. Doesn't matter how big your game was and how you got to the end. And that is most important. Congrats. <laughs> and um, I guess another con could be like, there's not a lot of like really good editing at the indie level of visual novels. So sometimes it can go really, really long when it should probably be a lot shorter. And I think, I don't know if they still do it in, in Asia and Japan, but like they used to pay um, visual novel writers based on how large the file size was, based on how many words you put into oh, wow. it. So they like a lot of depth um, to that. I think also in the, in the sense though, because it's so difficult to make a visual novel that some um, writers themselves from visual novels actually moved into the light novel field. Mm. They got a lot more uh, leverage and push the point. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and move on to the next question. And then, so we're going to talk about specific advice for, we have for people who are wanting to go into these fields. Uh, so let's go on to the next part of the poll. Uh, do we want to just talk specific advice or do we have a question that goes with that? Well, I can tell you advice for um, people who want to start writing. The best advice and the advice that all really great writers give is if you want to be a writer, you have to write. And it sounds so simple and it sounds so straightforward and it's also so true. Uh, Neil Gaiman talks about it, you know, everybody talks about it. If you if you want to be a writer, you've got to actually sit down, get the butt in the chair and the words on the screen or on the paper or however you want to do it. Um, <clears throat> so the if you uh, if you don't do that, if you don't get some words out there, you can't call yourself a writer. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I, I've met people who are like, I'm a writer. I'm like, oh, yeah, what have you written? Well, I have some ideas. Sorry, you can't be a writer if you don't write. Um, and it, it, and if you're scared that it won't be good, you just get it out there. You just keep writing. And the more, it's a skill. The more you write, the better you will get, especially if you are actively trying to become a better writer, if you're showing it to people saying, what's wrong with this? What do I need to fix? Um, especially people who are, know how to tell you what needs to be fixed. Uh, that will help you become a better writer. 
Nara, how about you? Advice for people who want to be to write visual novels? Um, well, one is you need to consider that there are going to be illustrations and that does sometimes shape what 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 I'm writing. I ha I'm having to think, okay, in this section, what is the scene that's going to get illustrated? And sometimes I'll look at a, a, a section, I go, well, there really isn't one. So I have to kind of visualize that in advance. A, a lot of the same thing. Um, I guess the other thing is, this is this is advice I got as a as a counselor, which I found is invaluable. Is if someone set gives you a criticism, no matter how out le left field it is, there's a germ of truth in it. It's true. Now you have to work down what what is true. But if you don't, th that attitude freed me up to, you can tell me something's bad and I can say, okay, let me look at it as opposed to, oh no, wait, wait. You can't, you can't regard your word as sacred. You have to be willing to change it, to, to pull out those lovely gems. Um, so I guess that, that's the advice I have for visual novel, for, for, for light novels and, and just in general. Ari, any advice for people who want to get into writing serialized comics? Well, the standard advice is don't start with a big serialized comic. Start with a one shot. Um, figure out, you know, <coughs> your drawing pace. Figure out, you know, what you like to draw. Spend some time on YouTube. There's so many good tutorials out there seeing how different artists put stuff together and use all the time-saving advice that works for you. Um, and, yes, yeah, that was something small. Don't, like, and then once you're... Once you've got your small training wheel project, like everyone says that and it's absolutely correct. You don't want to start with something that's going to take you a decade because you don't have the experience. Just start with something, you know, just take those characters and put them in a coffee shop and do five pages with them in the coffee shop and then do your your 10 decade, 10 decade, your absolutely massive epic. Um, yeah, um, try not to get stuck in the trap of this thing I do three years ago is terrible and I want to redraw it because I'm a better artist because then you will never get anywhere because you will always be a better artist a few years down the line and you just need to accept this is fine. Um, also in general, this is fine. Like 70% is good enough. If you try and make everything 100% beautiful illustrated art, you will burn out. Um, figure out an, a style you can do without burning yourself out that doesn't take too long that still conveys storytelling you want to convey. I can't hear you. Can people hear Sorry me? about that. I had some background noise, so I was turning off my microphone. <laughs> um, Roxy, do we need to wrap this up or do we have a couple more minutes? Well, there's some more time. If you guys are all okay. up for it. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, did you want to talk about your, what advice you have for people who are interested in, in creating visual novels? It seems like a really interesting, different field. Yeah. Um, kind of like what Ari, um, alluded to, just start small, that way you get something under your belt. Um, there are game jams happening all the time. People just join that way. You can form a team or find like-minded people and just see this is really where you want to go before you invest in a slightly larger work. Otherwise, you have to learn everything yourself. You're going to be a solo developer, you know, writing, scripting, designing the sprites, the background arts, the, the design of the UI and the logos, and as well as finding all the music stuff as well. Um, if you are having a larger team, I think you really need to develop some pretty good, strong managerial skills. It's actually very often overlooked, especially if you're busy, involved in a role that you might lose track of everybody else and that you should really be able to do that yourself or find someone to help you and find a proper manager. Hmm. Yeah, that's it. Good advice. All right. Um, I think we're going to wrap up shortly, but I wanted to bring in one more question. And this is actually related to um, the last question about strengths and weaknesses. Um, what are your thoughts on cultural appropriation and how do you avoid it? And this is something that I struggle with myself. Um, 
not because I have set my uh, novels in a place. I, my my both of my novels are in fantasy uh, worlds, and so I, I don't have to worry about cultural appropriation as much. Um, but it did lead to some trickiness when I wanted to describe some of the characters. There was a character who, in my mind, had Chinese features, but you can't describe a character as Chinese in a world that doesn't have a China. <laughs> and a lot of the traditional words which we use in the Western English uh, sphere to describe um, Asian features, like almond-shaped eyes or or the, the ones which are now being used by some people who bring in Chinese translations, peach blossom eyes or phoenix eyes. All of these are um, very widely used, but uh, I've also read uh, Chinese people objecting to these terms uh, as being stereotypical or uh, otherwise um, culturally insensitive. And it left me kind of in a bind of how I wanted to describe this character. And in the end, I kind of just sort of skipped it, even though in my mind, they should have looked Chinese. And it was a little frustrating for me uh, trying to figure out how to how to do that, how to how to navigate that kind of twisting and, and difficult uh, place. So I'm interested to hear the answer from from other from the rest of you, um, how you deal with cultural appropriation if, if if what your thoughts on it are and how you try to avoid it. There's this really good Tumblr called Writing with Color um, where they have a bunch of different mods who will answer questions and they have archives that are tagged and you can go through and just read a bunch of different people's opinions, a bunch of different people's suggestions. And I mean, that might have been helpful for you, but in general, I feel like that's how you do with it. You you research as much as you can from people who are in these cultures and are open to sharing their opinions and you absorb and you try to be respectful of everything you've absorbed from everyone who's sharing their thoughts and their experiences. Um, there's all disability in Kidlit. Um, I don't think they run anymore, but they've got a great archive of viewing books with disability char disabled characters and um, just people sharing their experience. This was this was good, that this was bad, this didn't work for me, this did work for me, why this is great, why this failed. Like that's just really useful to take on board. That's really helpful, Ari. Thank you very much. Writing uh, the color, very good. Yes, I've I made a note yeah. of it. Um, Nara, what about you? You're, you're writing in a medium which is a, 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 a ja traditionally Japanese medium. Do you, does that ever make you uncomfortable? Oh, very. Hmm. I'm probably depending on, certainly there is a, there is a, a reasonable section of people who would say what I write is cultural appropriation. Hmm. I write Yuri. I write Yuri in Japan with Japanese characters. Um, I have traditionally tried to make a significant character that drives around having a some kind of Western background, um, to so that you know, sort of as a gloss for okay, I missed this point, but you know, this person uh, came over in junior high. Um, so how do I deal with that? Well, one is I stay sensitive. I recognize I am in this area, this sensitive area, and that I don't ever say this is Japanese. I say this okay. is set in Japan, but I recognize there are Western values in mine. I have, you know, I really, my characters have character arcs of individuation. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I listen, I try to listen. Um, I've done things like I'm very active on social media on, on Mastodon, and I have deliberately selected some people that I listen to who are, are trans mask because I want to have a trans mask character and I want to do a reasonable job. Um, I listen to my beta readers and other readers who may come back. I mean, I remember the first time someone said, you know, this is fat shaming. You don't mean it, but it is. And I go, oh, you're right. <laughs> and having to, to change it. Um, 
last week, I spent four hours trying to find a good alternative to blackballed. Um, mm. It's not a, not really a racist term, but it ha but it but it continues it. So it's a sensitivity, and I put mm. this question out because it's a very serious consideration from me, and I'm always looking for guidance on how I can not be doing it. It's mm. a good question. Uh, Roxy, uh, what about you? Um, what are your thoughts on cultural appropriation and how do you avoid it? I think everybody brought up really good points already. Um, pretty much, I just do a lot of research. Um, I think the current game, I actually have like quite a number of consultants that I've either found, I found myself or they've reached out to me. And I feel a lot more comfortable knowing there's people who are trying, you know, to look out for you and do the best work you can. And so, yeah, research and try to avoid token characters. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not sure if we're running into our time limit or not. Uh, shall we wrap up here or should we continue? Time to continue. You guys are up for it. Uh, if, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have time now? Yeah. Okay. Well, if you guys are uh, continue to be available, then uh, let's continue with the, uh, the next question on the slide. <clears throat> what do you personally find oh, challenging? <laughs> uh, well, I talked about my struggles in writing descriptions <laughs> so that I don't get just two heads, <laughs> two heads in a white room. Um, that's probably my biggest challenge in writing uh, and just length when I, when I start to get halfway through a novel, I start to run into the this sort of halfway through thing where I'm like, I'm not quite sure. I may have a clear idea of the end, but I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get there. That happens to me a lot. <laughs> um, how about how about you, uh, Roxy? What what do you find challenging? Marketing. <laughs> it's not really a matter of like if you build it, they will come. No, you really have to find your voice and shout out into the void and hope your audience that you know exists can somehow find you. So you'd spend a lot of time just doing social media as well as reach out to reviewers and streamers. And yeah, it's my biggest Achilles keel. Um, and I actually have no sense of music. Like I, some people are really good at adding music to their work and I'm just like, I have no idea. It's minor or major. And so I rely on a composer to do most of the harder part of that job. Yeah. Nara, how about you? What do you personally find challenging about writing web, uh, uh, light novels? Oh, your your voice, we are not hearing you. Somehow your microphone seems to have been turned off, even though you're not muted, technically. Tell you what, uh, Ari, let's move on now? to you. Oh, there you are. Okay, yes. yes, there we are. Feedback? I mean, you said, I mean, I went to serialization because I, 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 I'm not going to be very good. Um, actual writing things is I I do a lot of it, my novels are very introspective, introspective characters, and that can get and that that can get it's like you're talking heads. It's a little different, but I have it's this no 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 go no we got to do something here we got to do something <laughs> yeah Hamlet shut up. <laughs> Those are kind of the, the the two is just speaking the speaking into the void and and um, getting keeping some action going get, getting getting a good balance there. Mm. Ari, how about you? Well, I've already said that art is time consuming and I have limitations. I cannot do many things, including horses and other things. Um, that's hard. Um. Also, look, I'm in my 30s, so I'm not old, but I can feel myself aging. Um, art, art is physically demanding. You, you need to take care of your hand and your wrist. Um, you need to get up and stretch. You need to, yeah, like if you, if you hurt your wrist, like RSI is absolutely a thing with comic artists. Um, you need to take really good care of yourself so you don't hurt yourself so that, and, you know, have to take a really long enforced break. Um, yeah. That's a really good point. Um, I have a daughter who struggles with chronic pain, who's an artist, and 
she's very young and she's still it's something she's already struggling with. So take care of your hands, your wrists, make sure you do your stretches. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. All right. Good advice. Uh, Roxy, can we have the next slide? When do people get to read your work? Well, we addressed that a little bit. Um, for me, um, the only people who see it are my editors until it is published, until I, we put it out in, in the bookstores on Ingram Spark. Um, <clears throat> so that's, you know, that, that's a little limiting in some ways. Uh, but also freeing in others. I, 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 it frees me to make mistakes uh, and fix them before it goes out. Um, so Ari, you, you people see your work as it goes along, right? Yeah, um, yeah. My, my patrons get to see it as soon as it exists. I'm not mm -hmm. too worried about mistakes because they are nice and they will tell me and I will fix them. Uh, <laughs> um, and That's then a couple neat. of months later, other people get to see them, yeah. Um, That's interesting. That so bad. you... You actually have a smaller pool who sees it first, your patrons, and then- I have a nice small pool. And they're very enthusiastic. Like they're really safe set of readers, you know, whereas the wider world, some of them are nice, some of them are <laughs> dangerous, you know, <laughs> anyone could be out there. But you know, <coughs> my small pool of patrons, they're, they're my safe place to share. That's really interesting. I hadn't considered it that way in, in terms of serialization, but that's something that modern, um, Patreon and, and other platforms like that have allowed is that kind of um, releasing to a smaller audience first and then to a smaller audience of, of patrons specifically people yeah. who are paying you first yeah. and then sharing it with the wider world that's a that's yeah. a sort of a kind of a in between happy medium between it is. Yeah. complete serialization it's just, yeah and Nara did, does most do most people not get to read it until it's published or uh, do you have anybody else who gets to read it there? Beta readers. Um, my, 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 my Patreon never took off, so. And I think I've I've, I've addressed this particular issue several times, so I don't really have much to add. I, I, I write yeah. I write I write serial line. Yeah, and Roxy, I imagine uh, pretty much only your team gets to see it and uh, until it's released into the wild. Is that right? Pretty much. I mean, I also have a Patreon. I also you know, share a little bit, maybe a little bit of spoilers, a little bit of research behind things, but they pretty much just see images maybe earlier than everybody, but otherwise not much in the story. So when everything is done, it is out. But what is everything? Who knows, right? The polish, yeah. the last 10% is like, could be indefinite. <laughs> you go on forever, <laughs> you want to make it perfect or not. But it's also scary because even if you release the game, you don't really get that satisfaction. You're actually kind of just sitting there waiting for a glitch or a bug report to come in. So you're not even happy when the game is out. You're just kind of waiting for that. And if you have to read reviews as well, because sometimes feedback of the bug report could be in the review. So mm, oh that's rough. <laughs> I make yeah. other people I make other people read my reviews first and and help uh, screen them for me. <laughs> like, tell me if there's yeah, yeah. bad review. I don't want to see it. I don't want to know. <laughs> or you can you can soften it for me or at least you know help me prepare myself to to read it. So that's it's tough to have to read through everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, shall we move up? Yeah. Fan versus indie versus pro. Great topic. Can you do this for a living? Well, I will give full disclosure. Um, this is not my primary income. Uh, it, it is uh, my my career yeah. choice, but I have another source of income, uh, which allows me to write at a pace that I choose <laughs> rather than the pace that, that necessity demands. Um, writing, obviously, you can write for a living. Uh, those who do, they write all the time. They they treat it like a job. They write, uh, and, and I, I have now, because I, I go to a lot of conventions and I'm on a lot of panels, I've met a lot of professional writers. And um, it's it's at least an eight hour a day gig, just like any career. You you got to get there. And, and maybe you're not physically writing for eight hours a day, but you are editing, you are getting on social media or, or whatever you to promote yourself. 
um, and you are continually creating content so that you have the next thing out so that you can sell it uh, as a as a professional novelist. The there's a this is a something I I want to address because it's this it's this idea that you can write a novel and publish it and then live on the proceeds for the rest of your life. And that is not how the real world works. <laughs> you know, we can't, we, you know, we, we're statistically, nobody even gets published, let alone is, you know, JK Rowling or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to make money, you absolutely can, but you need to start writing and keep writing and keep producing content. And the people who live off of their writing, they produce many novels a year, not just one, but like um, look at what Shannon McGuire says about it, where she'll bring out new novels like every few months. And it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an incredible thing. Um, and uh, I don't know how, if I could do it without burning out, if I was trying to, to live off of the proceeds of my writing. And I have an enormous respect for people who do. Um, I want to say too that as a writer, there's nothing wrong with fan writing, uh, writing for fun, putting your work out there without trying to get money from it, doing it as a hobby, yeah. whether it's fan fiction or whether it's just uh, original writing that you're doing for fun, that's okay too. You don't have to feel like just because you can write or like to write that it's something that you have to turn into a career. You can do it for fun. That's okay. <laughs> I give you permission. <laughs> Nara, what do you have to say about, uh, what do you think about it, doing it for a living? I probably fall between the fan and indie. I'm, I'm kind of walking that line between the, the two. My daughter writes, and what she says is the same, what you just said, is if you want to make a living at this, you have to write all the time and you have to publish constantly, at least as the as an indie, pub, uh, an indie writer who publishes you, you have to produce volume to, to, to make a living. You I'm kind of in between. Um, I don't really think that um, there is m much opportunity for a Westerner <laughs> to make a living in light novels. I think if, if you really want to make a living, you're probably better off steering into novels or something else. Um, People just don't want, publishers and people don't want um, light novels by Westerners. Um, the market of this kind of thing probably is is, is like vellum, um, serialized romance. And I, I may mm. look at that. That that might be a an avenue that that that, that might work with, um, with Yuri, depending on if the, the niche is big enough. That's a good idea. Vellum for for people who aren't uh, in the publishing industry is Amazon's new serialized platform um, to release uh, pieces of a story at a time and have subscribers who, uh, and the more subscribers you have, I understand, the more money you get. Uh, not that you get very much, but you get some. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, what do you think? Only Can you? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nara. It is only romance. Oh, you you cut out at the end there. Can you say it again? Oh no, you're still cutting out. You're we're not hearing you. Back I'm getting is that only romance writers are making money on vellum. Mm, that doesn't that doesn't surprise me. Only romance novels are making money on vellum right now. Ari, uh, how about um, what do you think? Can you do it for a living? Actually, before I talk about web comics, I might actually talk about web novels for a bit mm. because I think maybe I read some web novels in different spaces and can actually add in a little bit to there. Um, I've seen, again, very few people get to make a living, but I've seen non-romance serialized stories make a living um, on Royal Road. Um, some of the most popular stories there have like 20K, 30K monthly patrons, which is insane. Um, but they're definitely making a living. I've seen some people um, talk about how they're earning like a lot on Kindle Unlimited um, where you get paid by Kindle for every page, I believe, that people read. Um, and again, that I believe that path does exist for non-romance um, web fiction, um, but it does seem to involve a massive amount of work. Like some of the stories I read on World Road Update, you know, daily with, 
you know, two to three K word chapters. It's insane. I don't know how they do it. Um, but there are there are other paths, I guess, for non-romance, but I think it's much more limited. Um, interestingly, in web comics, I feel like romance is again um, the more the the better path if the goal is financial success. Um, the mm. some non-romance and fully independent web comics do do it, like Ava's Demon, for example. Um, not a romance, not paid by a big company. Um, I believe that that's paying for itself for that the 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 creator works full time on that I believe um mm. and has an awful assistance um I did do this for a living briefly when webtoon was paying well not briefly for a few years when webtoon was paying for me um it's it's a lot of work as discussed you know either you're drawing a lot or you're writing a lot um it that if it suits you and you get the offer you can do it it doesn't suit me right now so I'm not doing it anymore um so I'm definitely indying it right now um it's more possible to make a living on web comics now than it was a decade ago for sure um with both multiple publishers and with patreon um if you're doing a romance if you're working in an art style that appeals on webtoon canvas is definitely the biggest readership um if you're willing to do um not say for work out on Patreon, um, that will help. Um, you can definitely, there are, there are surprising, you know, I would say there are hundreds of people doing it, which I don't think could have been said, like, you know, even five years ago, um, people making a professional living without even publisher support. But if you have publisher support, you've got that too, and you've got um, financial backing and you've got deadlines. So you can do it for a living. It's not easy. And not many people get to do it. And you really need to look at the market if that is your goal and find something that like is what you want to do and what the market will pay for and find that overlap. Um, BL does really well on Patreon, but that is not what this talk is about. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that romance does well and Yuri is a romance genre. Yeah. So that is something to consider. Although, unfortunately, it does not have the tremendous following that BL does, BL being boys love, obviously. Um, so we uh, we get we Yuri fans get a little little left behind. I mean, my first novel was was uh, was male male romance. Um, so we will we will see if if uh, if Yuri becomes more popular. Um, perhaps we will be leading the vanguard for that. Roxy, what do you think? Um, can you do this for a living? Do you do this for a living? <laughs> I um, do this for a living because I have like a financial support so the partner can help me be creative um, so I guess a very common but very disliked advice among game developers is that uh, don't quit your day job yeah it's a long grind you gotta be able to make sure you have money to pay your team or get yourself to the finish line and so a lot of people end up like freelancing as well they do writing or they do art or they do whatever little parts of other roles for other games um, I guess you also could join bigger studios that actually have proper uh, funding with grants or they actually have successful games they can hire you to be professional that way Kickstarters I do yeah I do know a few game developer um, visual novels and that uh, if you release enough games you do make enough passive income because you're constantly making money every month for your sales and that you can be uh, make money that way and yeah you can actually do it for a living that is true. And that's true with books too, right? If you if you write mm -hmm. enough books and you sell, you know, even even a few a month uh, or even a few a day, then then you're actually making some passive income. And the more books you publish, the more that happens. Um, also, every book you write, every game you make, every every comic you put out there is a chance to get noticed, um, which is part of the reason why if you keep writing, if you keep producing content, um, you're gonna you're gonna do better uh, because you're just gonna have more out there to get noticed. Um, but yes, so I, I think I think we all agree if you if you want to do it for a living, you have to treat it like a job. Um, it's not it's not a I get to draw when I feel like it or I get to write when I feel like it. You got to get the, the butt in the chair in front of the computer and and create. Uh, and you have to be ready to do that for many hours every day. When when I tell want like like people who want to write, 
when I tell them that there's a lot of people who are like, oh, <laughs> like I didn't realize this was a job and it makes a difference for people. So if you're having that, if you're watching this and you're having that little epiphany moment of, oh, I didn't realize it actually meant work, <laughs> like like work, work, like 40 hours a week or more of of work to to do it, to, to make a living at it, uh, and sometimes a pretty uncertain living, then take a step back, reevaluate if this is a path that you're trying to take and see if this is something if something you're ready to do. All right, can we move on to the next sl slide, see what's next? Ah, and in tying into that, we say, I wanna create uh, what's right. I like writing, I like drawing, so, if you like writing, the novel, the light novel route. If you like drawing, the comic, the animation route. And if you like both, or if you uh, are willing to hire somebody, <laughs> as Nara pointed out, the visual novel or perhaps the illustration route. Um, and it's it, there's a little thing in the corner there. What about audio folks? That's a, a whole different discussion, but uh, certainly uh, there's a lot of um, popularity, in, increasing popularity of audio books. So if reading aloud is something that you enjoy, that's that's a route that you can try to pursue. Um, I bet audio folks also like people who create music and do audio would be good in the game field. What do you think, Roxy? Was that something that that you think uh, might be worth pursuing if you're a creative person, but you want to work in sound? Do you think the the uh, the game field would be a good uh, the 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 visual novel field would be a good a good avenue for that? Yeah, we always need really good um, original composers who really like the work. And also if they can do sound effects in case you do any bit of audio mixing and editing, that's all very well needed. Um, as long as there's a budget, you know, they're always well loved. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Shall we step on to the next question? You could always really change questions. mediums at any time. Yeah. Well, that's true. You can always change mediums, right? If, if you're if you're not happy what you're doing, like I said earlier, if you find yourself drawing more and more and you're not writing as much and you want to maybe, maybe that's something to lean into. Um, maybe look at a comics route, look at a, a visual novel route, or even look at doing illustrations for maybe becoming a freelance uh, visual novel artist or something like that. And of course, vice versa. Um, maybe branch out and see, try something new that you haven't tried before. See if if, uh, if there's something that you haven't done. I've certainly been very interested in talking with um, Ari and Roxy because their their uh, media <laughs> is sort of different from my own. So it's been really interesting hearing about uh, how how their not their their approaches differ from mine. Anybody want to add anything before we move to the next slide? Um, I might add that I feel like Yui Fan, Zui Jin are very medium flexible. I feel mm. like in a lot of genres, people have a specific medium they want, whereas people who are, who like Yui will, will go for any medium. Like I, I'm coming back to my patients again, but they'll be talking about, you know, books as often as they're talking about comics. Um, like, I think, I think this is a good genre. That's, that's I'm not even sure if genre is the right word, yeah. but I think, if you like lots of mediums, if you want to jump between mediums, we're, we're in the right genre for that. Yeah, I I think that's a good point. I think I think Yuri fans are hungry, right? Which yeah, they may they may be a niche audience, but it's also kind of a guaranteed audience in the sense where people are really looking. The people who want it really want yeah. it and aren't getting enough of it. So that's a, that's a kind of an advantage in a way too, isn't it? All right, shall we move to the next slide? Um, I think that's about it. Unless you want to ask that one title question, otherwise we're good to uh, we've got a couple. We've got a couple more questions. Um, one is, how did you decide the name of your title? <laughs> Ari, how about you? How do you decide your titles? Um, all right, I don't remember <laughs> anymore how I decided on Always Human. I, um, I just wanted something Googleable. I wanted something that fit in with a, I, I, something I could name. I love it when titles can be name dropped. So I wanted something that I could name drop or partially name drop. And that gave off the right, I don't remember. I, I 
I'll jump to my current webcomic, Seven Days in Silver Glen, which was originally called Flowers and Fangs, but people kept on thinking there were vampires in it, so I had to change it. Oh. Um, something I learned, I've learned from webcomics, is that people can be very surprised when it ends. So I thought, I want a title that will let people know what the ending is. So my current webcomic will end after Seven Days in Silver Glen. People will know that that is happening, and no one will be indignant when it's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's also very Googleable. Like having a Googleable title is very important. That I is think. true. That is true. Roxy, do you get input on the titles of the games that you work on? Uh I just kind of just ask friends what they think if it sounds interesting. I think I just picked like a really short uh title like for Inuyasha and I wrote those for like Mizuchi. It's easy to pronounce, mm. easy to spell, mm. straightforward. Red Rebellion, everybody kind of likes alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> Nara, how about you? I, I noted you had a fun title when we were looking at the uh, books before. How do you come up with them? First off, I decided I want to signal my audience. And, and <coughs> so I've adopted a Japanese style um, light novel. So this is very, very typical of, of Japanese light novels. Um, the, the, the marking rationale is people only look at the title. So like you said, you looked at my title and you've got it. You, you don't need to read a blurb. You already <laughs> know. That's there's something true. Cursed going on that's going to kill him and there's going to be sex in this story. <laughs> um, do I get feedback? Yes, I, I will generate. I start generating titles. I have a list of them, and then I send them out to friends to begin with and say, well, what do you think of this title? And I don't always follow their advice. Um, I, I look at it, and I probably my next novel, I'm probably actually going to do a poll and see what different variations of, of, the, um, of, of the title, what, what people want. I'm, I'm looking right now at, um, what is it? For the love of my Kambini um, idol, I, fa I faced her Henri lover. So we'll, we'll see how that one flies. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is it summarized the story in a sentence. I'm, I'm, impressed that, I'm impressed with that. Titles are something I struggle with. Um, and it's either, it's either I, once in a blue moon, I get the title first. And that's what happened with the eighth key. Even before I knew what the story was about, I just had the idea, bing, the eighth key. What is the eighth key? I don't know. <laughs> but it, it came into my head one day and and I had these, you know, sort of general ideas for the, the two main characters. And, and so I kind of was like, all right, now I have to figure out what these two keys are. <laughs> Why are there eight keys? What's the eighth one? What, what, what are these keys? Are they real keys? Are they vision? Are they, are they uh, representations of something else? Uh, so um, that was fun, and it really it really led the story, and I, I I was very happy about that. But then for my recent story coming out um, with the sapphic um, retelling of Snow White, I was like had no idea what I wanted to title the story, and uh, and it was a lot of brainstorming, and I'm I don't know if I should say this. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I, uh, my, my husband and I sat down and, and talked to, uh, an AI to get some ideas from it just for the title. I would never, ever, ever, nobody should ever produce creative work via AI, but it did give me some ideas to get in the right direction for the title I wanted. And that, so I ended up with mirror of my heart, which is the kind of thing I wanted. <laughs> so <laughs> on that really embarrassing note. Um, actually, we do have one more question if we want to, if we want to address oh, we it. We got to finish up right here. <laughs> okay. Then we're going to, we're going to wrap up right here and now, um, uh, just say everybody can find me at journeypress.com. And hopefully after my last admission, you don't just shun me and, and, and say, oh no, I'll never read anything you wrote. Um, Ari, where can we find you? Ah, uh, you can Google walking north. Um. <laughs> <laughs> walking north. okay yeah, Nara, walking where can, north. Where can we find where can we find Sorry. your work you can find my work on 
Pixiv or AO3. If you want to find me, I'm most easily to find on Mastodon or Twitter. Okay. And Roxy, where where do we find your work? Um, Steam, Itch.io, and the consoles later, which would be uh, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation, and the Xbox. Oh, very exciting. Very cool. All right. Um, and so thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you, panelists, for showing up mm -hmm. and, and, and talking with me for an hour and a half. Um, really enjoyed this conversation. Learned a lot. I hope uh, you, our audience, did as well. Um, and uh, we'll see you again next time on Yuri Studio. <laughs>